there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Varun Shriram with Generation UCAN, and our topic of discussion is Off-Season Nutrition 101. For all of you who are on the line that are endurance athletes, triathletes, runners, uh, you may have just completed the New York City Marathon or the Chicago Marathon, some other big fall race. You might have just gone to Kona or completed your big Ironman for the season. Uh, we want to get you thinking about the off-season and why you might want to think about the fueling demands and your nutrition strategy a little bit differently during this period of time. And nobody better to uh, be joined by than Dina Griffin, registered dietitian, who is well-versed on all things nutrition and specifically this topic as well. Dina, thanks so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Varun. I'm so excited to be back with you. And hello to all the people out there in the uh, webinar world. It's wonderful to have you uh, with us again, Dina. I know uh, many here on the line tuned into the last uh, discussion you and I had back in July, which was a, a very different theme, certainly. Uh, people were in the, the heat of training season, and, and we talked about metabolic efficiency as it pertains uh, more to training. Uh, metabolic efficiency is certainly something that you're, you, you know is, is very much a part of your core nutrition philosophy and something you'll touch on today. But, but today we want to talk specifically about the off season and, and how fueling really changes. Um, Dina, from your perspective, having worked with, um, well, you know, actually, before I get your perspective, why don't you tell the folks um, on the line who don't know who you are a, a little bit about you and, and the types of athletes um, you work with? Oh, sure. Yeah. So I am a registered dietitian, but I'm also a board certified sport dietitian um, based out of Colorado, although I work with athletes all over the country and um, overseas as well. Um, my focus the last number of years has been um, with the endurance athlete community. So we're talking everything from um, cycling to running, triathlon, some adventure sports and racing, um, swimming, and that sort of thing, um, even some, some um, trekkers out there. So um, the gamut is really all over the place in terms of the endurance community and age groups as well. So I think. Um, everything from 16 to 66 is my uh, age span and all levels of athletes. Wonderful. So, uh, Dina, and, and just one quick comment. Um, somebody from the audience mentioned he can hear me well. Um, he can hear you pretty well, but if you just um, want to, I, I think you should be okay. Uh, There's just one comment, but if you just want to make sure to speak up into the phone, that would be great. Oh, yeah. Um, we definitely adjust the headset here. I was going to say we don't want to miss a word of wisdom that you have to uh, impart on us today. But uh, you know, Dina, from a training standpoint, before we talk about the off season, let's define it. What what is the off season? I mean, for most of the triathletes or, or endurance athletes you, you're working with, certainly they're not just completely you know doing nothing and sitting on the couch for three or four months so what exactly uh, would you say the off season is how do you define it yeah I don't consider the off season total um, rest time and I don't think most active people or endurance athletes do or, or any kind of athlete it's more um, in my mind or this context what we're talking about this evening is some um, less structured training time so the volume of training or exercise time may be reduced. The intensity may be reduced. Um, you know, there's not a um, high demand for um, lots of training time put in every week. Um, but that's not to say that we're sitting on the couch for all of those hours. It is more just leisure activity, still some training or exercise, whatever our passions are. Um, but it's, it ha tends to coincide also with the holiday season for a lot of us here, at least in the um, northern hemisphere. Um, and so you kind of get these two things together with some holidays coming in and then this um, more restful time or this adjustment time to the new season, which often is next calendar year. So as we dive into this, we're really going to base our discussion today on, on four different topic areas. Number one, we're going to talk about why we actually need different nutrition plans for different times of the year. Um, Dina's told us what the off-season is. Now we want to understand why we should think about fueling differently. Uh, we're also going to touch on the goals that most athletes are looking to achieve in the off-season and, and how 
adjusting the fueling plan can help you achieve those goals. Um, I'm going to talk about what the focus of the off-season nutrition plan should be, uh, what food should you focus on, how should you think about pairing foods. Um, and then finally, we'll close with uh, discussing why you can, um, that many of you are familiar about why it's different from your typical sports nutrition products and how it can also be utilized uh, in terms of off-season nutrition to help manage your energy and manage your blood sugar levels. So we're going to touch on all of that here over the next 35 to 40 minutes. So let's let's start really with the why idea. Why uh, do we need different nutrition plans for different times of year? Why should athletes adjust their intake um, and, and adjust their strategy based on what they're doing? It's something that not all of us think about, but I, I mean, we can say simply, if we just think on a daily basis, that we don't live um, like a robot, you know, we're, we are very different every day of our living. So we may move differently or live differently or exercise differently every single day. Um, hence, you know, our nutrition needs to adapt to that or match it as close as possible. Um, on a grander scheme, and you can see from the slide, um, this is actually an example of, of maybe a typical endurance athlete who has a big race um, towards the end of the fall, so September, October time frame, um, to show that oftentimes the energy expenditure or the, the calories that one burns throughout a season or a training cycle or a whole year um, ebbs, ebbs and flows, um, as does energy intake, so the food that we consume. But you can see here um, there, there's some mismatch that can occur throughout a training year or the calendar year, however we want to look at it. Um, and for the purposes of our discussion, we're talking off-season. So in this example, and in, and for a lot of us here on the call um, when listening, it, you know, off-season tends to be those winter months or November, December, into January, where we've got downtime, races are done, holidays are here, and we're moving on to the next year. Um, you know, and so you can see from the trend lines that for a lot of athletes, the expenditure, so those calories that we're burning after peak race is done, you know, we're, we're we have, um, like for, you mentioned, um, New York City Marathon's done, and we have a couple big races left here this month, but um, after that, a lot of athletes tend to not adjust their the food amounts they consume. So you see that big mismatch in, in expenditure or, or calories burned versus um, what's being consumed. And that can lead to a whole host of issues um, for people. And so that's kind of it uh, in terms of the why and, and a little bit about what happens for, for some athletes. And I would say it's actually very common. Um, some of us intend for this to happen because we've just train so hard and we work so hard the whole year and, and we'll talk more about that upcoming um, but for a, a lot of us we don't intend for this big um, gap to occur this big mismatch to happen yeah and Dina you know you, you started to tease maybe a little bit of the next um, part of the discussion but you know there's there's the why that we just talked about which is why do we need different nutrition plans for different times in training and I guess there's also the why um, just the psychological why, right? Like why do people during this time sort of let themselves go or, or let, let the nutrition plan go? And, and, and this may not be a very, uh, it, it could be a seemingly obvious question, but, but I'd, I'd like to hear your take on it. You know, from, from your standpoint with athletes, you, you touched on it a little bit, but, um, you know, certainly the holidays, the weather, those, those all tie into it. What else do you sort of see psychologically with the athletes you work with, with uh, as the why behind um, why the nutrition plan can just be let go uh, during this period of time? Yeah, I think a big one, Varun, is um, um, habits that form. I mean, you can see even just from this example slide we're looking at, I, I mean, if we're used to um, exercising, training a whole bunch for a good portion of the year, uh, a lot of us form habits around food and those connections. So some of it may be legitimate, some may be emotional, some are 
um, you know, these feeding windows that we have can be short just because we're all so busy with all of our other life things going on. Um, and so, you know, once once the big race is done uh, in, in the whatever time it is for us, um, it's hard to just switch off those habits or even recognize what's going on because we don't always consciously think <laughs> about nutrition. Um, and, and so that can be that big switch. Um, and then you combine it with holidays. I know for a lot of us, like, oh, Halloween, that sets it off. Um, and, and so just things can take hold from there and, and not let go. And it's interesting, you know, outside of the holidays to also hear you talk about the habit forming because, you know, at first glance, I think people might look at this and, and intuitively it makes a lot of sense, right? It's uh, when, when the level of activity goes down, certainly either the caloric intake or the emphasis on what uh, nutrients people are consuming, it, it certainly makes sense that those would shift. But I guess the habit forming nature of it when you're spending several months consecutively training a certain way and eating a certain way, the, the, the whole habitual element of it can be very tough to, to get past. Exactly. It's kind of, I mean, it is complex, right? We're not very straightforward um, individuals and human beings, so there can be so many variables that come into play here. Um, you know, let alone, like I just alluded to, um, stressors from life or change in sleep habits and um, for parents, you know, schools and in, in going on, and so you have all of those activities, and it just can be overwhelming um, and change the way we eat or the way we treat food. So, for the athletes you're working with, Dina, when this off-season period rolls around, and, and they're understanding, you know, they're they're working with you, so obviously they're they're cognizant of their nutrition and and under perhaps understanding of, um, you know, how the nutrition needs to shift. What are the goals that most of the athletes you're working with are trying to achieve um, during this off-season time? So <laughs> the goals vary based on the individual and, and personality. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've, I see all kinds of things, and, you know, I've lived it too. I think nutritionally some of the goals can be from, yeah, as this slide shows, um, like that that first one there, um, I'm just going to hang as is with my nutrition and, I, you know, I want to enjoy the upcoming holidays or social gatherings or, or whatever it is, function, work functions and get through this time but let myself enjoy maybe a little bit more than I have and get, get through this relatively unscathed um, but relax a little bit. And, and then you've got people from your, your group B there where it's like, um, anything goes, sky's the limit, let's just enjoy, you know, to no end, um, and that might not be the best for health, but, but a lot of people um, will reach out to me then after the first of the year, you know, when all the, the bulk of the holidays are done, um, because it's, it's that time that they want to refocus and, and start anew, um, freshen up their nutrition and get back to where they want to be. Um, and that can be a tough situation. In fact, I was just reading some comments from um, some other um, sports-related researchers. Just average weight gain can be five to eight pounds for athletes. Um, you know, and some of us need to gain weight. Some of us don't. Some of us want to maintain um, or lose. And then you've got that group C where... Um, they may buckle down a little bit just because they know in the past they've tended to go off the deep end or just get to a place where um, food habits worsen or they get into some bad ruts that they just know aren't the best for them come next year. They have to start, um, start over again or work harder to get where they want to be, whether that's racing weight or um, you know health parameters they're trying to correct or fix. Um, and then I guess option D would be those people that, that maybe do need to gain a little weight or build some muscle, um, and so nutrition can be different. I just don't see that as commonly with the individuals I work with. In theory, maybe a lot of us like to think that we can, you know, kind of follow number two, and uh, even if we are doing dealing with the... Uh, free-for-all and anything goes approach, you kind of think, hey, once once it's time to get serious, I can rein it back in. 
in, in your personal experience, whether it's working with athletes or whether it's it's yourself, um, are there, I, I don't know if dangers is too strong of a word, but is it common for people to think they can handle that approach better than they actually can? Uh, I, You know what? I think people learn. Uh, it's like trial and error and correction. <laughs> I, I feel like, and from what I've seen, sometimes, bad things have to happen before we, we learn the right way or a better way. Um, I, I would say that when, you know, we can, we all have our own personal thresholds and some, for some of us we can get sick, um, immune system falls apart, um, you know, bad things happen to health. And so I, I would say mind doesn't always um, jive with what the body wants to do. So we may think that, and, and some of us that are younger, like in our 20s and 30s, can get by with a little bit more. But um, you know, us us masters athletes and beyond, we're we're having a little bit more of a struggle. Even though we may be wiser, um, it, it's still not as easy to um, let loose and 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 make it through 100%, no problem. You know, Dina, you're an athlete yourself, and, and I enjoy your perspective on these because you can speak to us both as a uh, as a dietitian as well as as an athlete uh, who's living this stuff. How, how has your um, personally your approach to the off season evolved over the years, or, or has it evolved much? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, I mean, I think I was one of those, you know, that younger like I burn it off. I'll run, I'll run tomorrow and more burgen off this extra cheesecake or whatever it was. Um, but that that's not how uh, human metabolism. It just doesn't work that way year after year, decade after decade of life. Um, so now, yeah, I'm much more. Uh, I should add to that, Varun. Like your relationship with food is is huge. Um, so I'm not advocating for um, like feeling guilty to have extras or special foods or treats or whatever it is. Um, you know, we all want to enjoy um, food and celebrate that. Um, but there is that healthy relationship with food that I think all of us have to learn as we experience life and nutrition and aging and what it does. Um, what it does to us from a health perspective and then from that um, physical aspect as athletes or active individuals, how is it you actually feel when you eat certain ways? Um, so I would say, yeah, I'm more in that A group where I might relax a little bit, you know, enjoy some different um, scenarios that I don't get during other times of the year, but, um, you know, it's it's mindfulness and um, still having fun with food, that, that's an absolute that we all should have. And, you know, the, the I guess the unspoken or, or obvious um, reality of this session today is that the people are on here and, and listening are, are people, of course, that are probably caring about how can they, you know, not sabotage their health and not totally sabotage their fitness in the off season, I'm guessing the people that don't care about doing that, um, you know, would, <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't be on here. So, um, you know, exactly with, right. with with that assumption in mind, you know, for the folks that are focused on on, on maintaining some level of health and, and fitness, um, you know, in the off season, let's jump ahead and, and talk about what what should the focus of the off season nutrition plan be? How, how should folks who want to keep themselves in some relatively good physical condition uh, approach the off-season. Yeah, good one, Varun. I mean, so I'm guessing like 99% of us listening are on this call. I mean, you can go to the internet or your favorite um, sports magazine and find 5 million perspectives on what to do in the off season and there are so many opinions so here's mine professionally and um, from my experience working with hundreds of athletes over the years um, off season nutrition I mean I number one is like I alluded to earlier enjoying some of this time because um, especially if you're a competitive athlete or your um, the bulk of your non off season is very demanding physically I mean, this is a time to relax a little bit. 
and I don't I don't necessarily mean that you have to eat completely different um, model of nutrition or do anything extremely radical it's just like let yourself enjoy food um, you know relax a little bit with friends and family um, still being mindful of the impact of your choices um, so that whole notion of blood sugar control which I'm a big believer and supporter of um, you know that's something we should still not throw away entirely like what is this food doing for me and being mindful um, of potential consequences when when you may go off um, the the you know daily healthable patterns so to speak um, so part of that I just want to add that enjoyment factor I think as a dietitian is like um, really savor foods especially if they're ones that you haven't had much of recently you know so a lot of people think of desserts um, or comfort foods for example so enjoy it if you have it meaning eat slowly um, you know taste the food um, don't be in a hurry and maybe um, a friend of mine used to say, put the fork down, you know, every few bites. So you just force yourself to really um, enjoy that sensory experience. Um, and I think, too, part of this, sorry to belabor the enjoyment part, but, um, it, you know, a lot of us are with family or friends or colleagues around off-season or holidays. And so um, being mindful that we're trying to enjoy the whole experience. So, like, the comfort and fun and pleasure comes from what we're doing, which not only includes what we eat, but what we're doing with those people. Um, so just the whole experience needs to be appreciated. Um, now, Dina, anybody, anybody uh, that's, you know, listened to you or, or is familiar with, with some of your work certainly, um, you know, it, it should be well-versed uh, on your belief in blood sugar control. And, you know, we've previously talked about um, blood sugar control in the context of, of training and, you know, being able to better manage your energy, being able to become more metabolically efficient and better at utilizing fat. Um, but how about blood sugar in the context um, of the off season when the, the training and the activity level isn't as high? How, how does blood sugar control sort of impact the, the food choices we make, the, the hunger we feel throughout the day? Is, is there a tie-in with blood sugar control and, and some of those? feelings that we experience day-to-day uh, -day outside of training? For sure, there can be, yep. I mean, depending on, on how far we um, go with our, our you know, choice of foods or amounts of foods, um, if, if we're not eating to stabilize blood sugar, um, we definitely can get like the blood sugar highs, the blood sugar low as a consequence, and, and that can come from an it, um, excessive load of, of maybe processed and refined um, carbohydrates or at, you know a whole bunch of added sugars in a particular choice or meal um, and so that can lead to um, you know cravings it's like turning on the sugar machine like I need more um, just because you can get in that cycle of, of turning you know you, you process that kind of carbohydrate and sugar quickly and um, you can get in that cycle um, and for some of us it just turns on a switch that we feel like we need more sugar to fix fix the low or fix the energy low um, and so then that leads to a whole host of things you know maybe overeating um, you know, bad moods, um, loss of focus, and, and um, sleep disruptions, and, you know, um, some inflammatory type response in the body, uh, you know, not so favorable consequences. So, you know, in, in part of that whole aspect of blood sugar control, I think this probably goes right into the, the, uh, the next point on the slide, but, you know, one of the things you talked about was avoiding a lot of these uh, packaged and processed foods that can cause cause a blood sugar spike. Um, so with that, um, cooking and ex experimentation in the kitchen, that's really something that you, I know, are an, an advocate of um, in the off-season. How, how, can, how can that um, help athletes make better choices, and, and how much do you recommend that be part of an athlete's off-season nutrition plan when they theoretically might have some more time because they're not training as much? <laughs> right. 
that's the theory, right? That we have a little more time. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I like to point this out or help educate athletes on this part just because if you do have the time, or actually I should say you should make the time because we are all are, um, we all should consider ourselves a priority. Um, and there are many benefits to doing this kind of thing, experimenting with different um, foods, meaning, you know, what's the buzz about beets, for example? Why are people talking about it? And I thought they taste like dirt. You know, so try it out. Maybe you need to purchase um, pre-cooked beets, for example, from your local grocery store to try them out and see what you think. And then maybe you cook them yourself. yourself. Um, or different cooking methods, like the slow cooker can be handy for batch cooking. Um, different kinds of um, gadgets and fun kitchen appliances to, to make your life easier down the road for food preparation for when those times pick up again with high training or exercise time um, and all the other things that can happen that, that impede your time to dedicate to food prep. So I think it's just a great time of the year to bring in different foods, experiment, share recipes, maybe go to a cooking class. I mean, I know it's not everybody can do that or has access to that kind of thing, but um, with the internet and social media, like we can all share some fun recipes. And um, it, you know, even with Jen, you can tr thinking about some other ways to use it now or in the future. Um, so that's kind of my experiment spiel. And you know, I, I, for anyone that's friends with you on Facebook, you know, we, we, we always like to see the uh, fun recipes that you share um, as well. So you, it's definitely something that I know uh, the experimentation in the kitchen is, is something that you uh, you practice what you preach in, in that regard. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you one more thing um, on that topic. Certainly, like your overall um, philosophy, even in, in training, like we talked about, centers back to blood sugar control, and and with that, you know generally speaking, uh, having more of a carbohydrate control throughout the year rather than being so high carbohydrate during training. You know, that's not something uh, just in general that, that you, you advocate. But how, does, does that shift even more in the off season? Is, is there any uh, easy rule of thumb that, that, you know, that you encourage people to look at in terms of carbohydrate, protein, fat in the off season that might be different um, at other times of the year? You know, I think it depends on the goals. I always say it depends. I mean, <laughs> uh, you, you've probably heard me say that a zillion times too. But I mean, if if your if your health currently is in a place where you know you need to make some changes, so that could be um, signs of maybe pre-diabetes or weight gain that's not desired. You know, like that midsection. Um, rubber tire that's starting to form, or um, you are noticing your lipid profile starting to be, you know, not ideal. Um, yeah, just taking a look at your health, or um, you you know that for your future, like next year, I I have I want to do differently in my race performance because I had all these issues. Um, with respect to nutrition, for example. It, now would be a good time to experiment a little more with that carb control approach. And there are different strategies. Um, that's kind of a topic for another discussion, but carb control can mean different things for different people. So it doesn't necessarily mean ketosis, and it doesn't necessarily mean um, continuing along your, your high carb route if you are one of those or kind of dabble in higher carb patterns. Um, so I think this time, Brown can be a good um, experimental time to look at, you know, and investigate, assess what it is you're eating in terms of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Um, you know, and the basic, if, if you just need a refresher, like I want to balance my blood sugar and make sure I'm in a good spot. Um, you know, metabolically leading into next year, that that one to one ratio, or where's my carb, where's my protein, and make them fairly um, equal or um, even in amounts in your meals can be a simple way to just manage um, carbohydrates throughout your day. 
it's a very simple model, like using your hands as one hand representing your, your carb um, foods, hopefully that are more nutrient dense, so your veggies, maybe some fruits or some um, good quality grains. Uh, and then that other hand being a quality protein source or multiple protein sources. And I guess, you know, Dina, it comes back to the fact with, uh, with number two that if, if you are experimenting in the kitchen and if you are, you know, trending to cooking more during this period of time, uh, then, you know, hopefully just by virtue of, of that and, and getting more fresh ingredients and, and whole foods in your diet, you, you're sort of achieving that by mistake. But I think at the same time, really, uh, you know, for some people who are numerically focused, understanding that that one-to-one -one carbohydrate to protein ratio, it could be at least a baseline uh, in terms of where to start to control your blood sugar. I think a lot of people um, find that to be helpful. Uh, anything else you would say uh, on, on the reflect side of things um, that you recommend athletes do in the off-season when, when evaluating their nutrition? You know, I think it's just helpful to really ponder, if, if you haven't already, um, how this past year went as a whole, especially if, if you are a um, recreational athlete, competitive athlete. Um, some of us write race reports, you know, after the big race and what went well, what didn't go well. And um, some people forget the nutrition part, um, like how did that actually go for you? Um, and just, you know, reflecting on, on yourself as an active person or what it is you want to achieve athletically. Um, I would say nine times out of ten, nutrition can always be optimized to take you to that next level. Um, but, but some of us just want to move on and let the bad experiences go. Like, oh, geez, that'll never happen again. But we don't really think about what what went wrong or what the opportunities are for improvement. Um, and so that's where, you know, maybe it's a, a new coach or it's um, just um, another health professional. I mean, not to do my shameless plug, but it could be a sport dietitian or, um, you know, um, some other kind of service to help you assess and, and just brainstorm what needs to happen. And that kind of goes to that point number four here on the, on the slide. Yeah, to tell us a little bit about that, you know, I know um, that you're a big proponent, um, certainly of of lab work and, and, you know, kind of getting people to take an actual hard look at the data and, and really understand what's happening inside. Um, how good of an opportunity is the off season to, to do some of those things that you might let slip during the course of the year? Yeah, I think, I mean, gosh, we have um, reason to do these things. So... Um, like I said, we can we can all take our health and, and even our athletic performance up a notch. Um, and I know that's easier said than done, but why not learn more about your body? Um, it's not a static thing, right? We're, we're a very dynamic system. Um, there's a lot going on in the human body, you know, minute to minute, but, but day to day, um, year to year. So it's a great time to think about scheduling blood work. Um, if you're an athlete competitively, there um, are companies that do athlete-specific blood work. So this isn't maybe your typical physical, you know, with your general doctor um, necessarily. So just specific blood work to you and what's going on or what we need to find out about you and um, other testing services, you know, um, sweat sodium testing or metabolic efficiency testing, particularly if you have had issues with your nutrition in training or competition. Um, and, and, you know, any kind of um, good dietitian in the sports nutrition field can help you um, do some fine tuning or planning for next year. So I think this is where we take all that reflection tidbits that we've learned about ourselves and, and move on it. Um, and make the next year even better. Well, that's great, Dina. And, uh, you know, as we're, we're talking year-end stuff, um, you know, for people that are, that are going to the, those holiday parties um, here over the next uh, several weeks, um, I know we're, we're a little early for that, but going to be honest before we know it. What are um, any strategies you kind of advocate for people um, that, that they can do 
perhaps beforehand, before going to a, a holiday party to help uh, them control what they might be tempted to eat at, at these, in these situations? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's some basic things. Some of us, I bet, know, know what to do, but we forget or we don't realize how important it is until, until we're at the gathering. But, I, I mean, being proactive certainly helps. Right, so um, starving yourself all day just to you know save quote unquote save those calories for for the um, binge at the party. Usually, people don't feel so hot the next day. Um, so I think it's just better to go into um, a social gathering or a holiday gathering. You know, you you might let yourself be slightly hungry going into that that event, but. Um, going into it deprived or starved or, you know, doing something radical a couple of days before just so that you can go wild one night, it usually just, just doesn't turn out as favorably as we thought it would. Um, so that can be, you know, like smart snacking prior, um, making sure that you're, if you're enjoying um, alcoholic beverages, you know, that you're paying attention to your hydration so you, you don't feel as lousy the next day, for example. Um, yeah, uh, but still that healthy relationship with food on the flip side, right? So still letting yourself enjoy some of those special foods. Um, but in appreciating the event, right, so, so that you enjoy the food, but the surroundings are equally important. Well, this is great, Dina. A lot of great tips uh, to, to hopefully give people some practical, uh, you know, some, some theoretical um, sense of why they should adjust their nutrition uh, during the off-season, and then some practical tips on, you know, what you can actually do um, to achieve better health and fitness during this period of time. Um, I want to take a few minutes just um, to talk about something you touched on earlier uh, in terms of Generation UCAN. And, you know, one of the things you, you mentioned um, was really that we should certainly de-emphasize a lot of these sugar-based sports nutrition products that, that we really don't need as much when the, uh, when the training is, is going down. Um, and, and even, you know, the packaged uh, sort of quick carbohydrate type of sugary foods uh, in general. Now, one of the really unique things um, about UCAN is, while it is uh, a nutrition product that many people use in training, and, and, you know, like you and I spoke about at length on the last webinar, all we were talking about UCAN for Ironmans, you know, UCAN for half Ironmans for these long-distance endurance events, because UCAN as a product is centered around stabilizing and, and blood sugar control, um, it's actually something that fits very nicely into the off season as well. So I'll just take a, a minute for those of you that aren't familiar with you can, um, it, it comes both in powder and bar form and it's a variety of different flavors. There's products with protein products without protein, but, but what kind of uh, binds all the UCAN products together is what we call super starch, which is the carbohydrate in UCAN, And, and it's uh, it's basically, it's a, it's a complex slow releasing starch that keeps your blood sugar and your energy levels steady instead of giving you that sugar spike. So from a training and fueling standpoint, um, if, if you go back and listen to, to the previous webinar Dina and I did together, we talked a lot about UCAN in the context of endurance events and how it's able to keep your blood sugar and your energy steady through several hours of training. But similarly in the off season, from an energy standpoint, UCAN can help you achieve the same thing in terms of keeping your blood sugar and energy levels steady without causing those fluctuations in, in your glucose levels, which, you know, like Dina told us, uh, if, if you have those blood sugar fluctuations, it can alter your mood, it can uh, impact your stress levels, it can impact your, your hunger levels. So really, one of the ways to combat a lot of this is to have in the background this idea that we should focus on our blood sugar. Uh, another area where you might find UCAN to be unique in the off season is that the carbohydrate, because it breaks down so slowly, it keeps the hormone insulin low. So insulin, when, when insulin is higher, your body cannot burn fat as efficiently for fuel. Now, you know, in, in the off season, like we talked about, you know, most of you folks aren't just, you know, vegging out and sitting on your couch for, for two months without doing anything. You might still be training at, at some level, I mean, you know, like you might not be structured training, but you might be going to the gym, you might be going out for a run. So 
again, if, if, in those situations, um, if you're looking for energy for your workouts and, and they're not, you know, these long endurance workouts, implementing you can as a fuel source prior to those workouts can set you up to better burn fat during your workout instead of spiking your sugars. Um, Dina, how, how do you uh, sort of think about you can in the off season? Uh, you know, we, we consider it, uh, I guess in, in one regard, um, sports nutrition because it fuels our sport, but in another regard, it's, not sports nutrition in the traditional sense. So, so how, how do you uh, view UCAN uh, in terms of its application during the off season? Yeah, I think it's a you know off season's a time where like like we've been talking about our training and exercise time is is likely less right or the intensity is less and this less structured training usually means I, I mean even if you are active for a few hours. Um, we don't need to rely on the classic sports nutrition products this time of the year. So I'm always a big advocate of put that stuff away and, and get back to whole food fueling. However, Jen, you can, we need to also remember, is technically a food product. Um, it, and because it works so well and, and very differently than those classic simple sugar-based products, um, Jen, you can can absolutely still fit in our off-season nutrition, um, and that you know could be part of um, the snacking or um, part of a meal or at you know with off-season and holiday season we may be running around a little crazy with holidays um, and all those those things going on. So um, using you can to just keep energy stable, um, not have to worry too much about those highs and lows that can happen with energy and, and mood and focus. And, you know, Dina, when you talked about being uh, experimenting in the kitchen and, and being creative, uh, you certainly uh, over the years have been more than creative uh, with your UCAN creations. Um, hopefully everyone can see this on the screen, but this is actually a, a recipe you, you recently shared on your blog, Dina, which is the uh, a pumpkin you can fudge bar, uh, which looks um, absolutely delicious, and I I just clicked out of it. Uh, you guys can see the recipe, hopefully um, on the screen, and I'll include a link to this uh, in the follow up email as well. But something like this, you know, give give us the rationale behind um, why you would add you can to a recipe like this, and 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 in what context somebody could use something like this uh, as part of their off season nutrition. Yeah, I was looking to experiment um, as a substitute flour, basically. And I've done this kind of thing with with some other recipes, but, um, you know, a lot of the flours, even wheat flour, it just produces um, a different blood sugar response, no matter what else is in the particular concoction. Um, so my intention was to use something unflavored, um, act as like a binder flour type deal and I'm not a food scientist or, or culinary expert by any means but um, I do like to dabble in the kitchen so um, and I just I mean I've used the plain you can for so many different purposes for the past number of years I just trust it um, and then you know this was another experiment with using a raw um, uncooked type of concoction, so something not baked, you, you know, um, and I was trying to make this um, plant-based as well, so vegan folks could also enjoy it. So I had a lot of intentions here, <laughs> trying to serve, <laughs> serve more than one purpose. Cool, and you know, on your blog, you, you reference it as, um, you know, in, in terms of adding UCAN as a, a source of slow-releasing, energy-stabilizing carbohydrates. So with that in mind, um, you know, this is certainly something that people could use uh, if they wanted to, to fuel a workout, but really just, you know, as dessert or, or, you know, as breakfast or snack in the middle of the day, right? This is something that people could really fit in um, at various times in their day, just depending on what, what their schedule is. That's totally correct. I mean, it's it's not necessarily, even though I called it a fudge bar, I think more because of its consistency, and it sort of reminded me of fudge my grandma used to make. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it can. I've had it before a bike ride. Um, I, I've had it as a snack. Just like I love pumpkin. I love you can. I love the chocolate um, part. The texture is, is nice. So, yeah, multi-purpose 
sort of um, little calorie boost there. Now, that's certainly, a, a, you know, and, and you've made many uh, different you can creations. Um, you, you, you know, you've made the little you can bites, which are kind of in ball form. Um, so several things, if you, if you uh, poke around Dina's blog, when you, you get the pumpkin fudge recipe email to you, you'll, you'll find several other um, you can creations. But, you know, Dina, certainly you've used you can in, in smoothie form as well. And, um, you know, the you can with protein uh, that I alluded to earlier, it, again, it contains the super starch in it, which is, uh, I just want to reiterate one more time, really the key ingredient and what's unique about you can, you know, so our, our you can with protein is not simply a protein powder. It's, it's protein paired with these slow releasing carbs in, in the super starch that'll keep your energy and your blood sugar nice and steady. Uh, now, Dina, you've used the, the you can in a variety of, of smoothies, both the, the versions with the protein as well as the plain. Um, similar question, what, what would be the rationale behind uh, you know, a, a smoothie that has the super starch in it versus just a plain protein shake? Like what might have benefit or, or an advantage that people might find um, when they're using the smoothie with the super starch in it? Yeah, so I mean, depending what else is in it, I, I mean, that, that you can, super starch is your carbohydrate source, so you don't necessarily need to add anything else to it, but, but this is what provides us that nice, long-lasting, you know, steady energy. Um, but when you pair it with the protein, I mean, that we've got the one-two combo right there, so um, satiation satiety, so fullness from that combination, um, tastes good, you know, um, it's not really the same as going to the Jamba Juice or the smoothie store to get um, that, you know, with with sorbet and, and um, fake fruit <laughs> and barely any protein, so this serves a very different um, metabolic purpose as well. So not only do we feel good, but we're doing our um, metabolism a favor as well. You know, that's such a great point, uh, Dean. I, I just wanted to pinpoint that a little bit further. I think so many times people almost automatically assume that if they're, they're consuming a meal or, or a snack in liquid form, uh, you know, whether if it's, if it's a fruit smoothie, that it's going to, you know, be, be healthy, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, but that's kind of a misnomer, right? Is, is, I mean, a lot of the, the smoothies that, that are being served up in, in sort of mainstream commonplace stores, they're, they're actually uh, very sugar-laden and not something that, that truly is energy-sustaining and, uh, I guess, satiating. Um, how, how much of, of that do you see with, with athletes that are thinking they're on the right track by, by, fo by following the smoothie approach if, if weight loss or, or weight maintenance is a goal, but, but actually in some ways might be sabotaging what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, it um, is a problem because thanks to marketing efforts, and I love all the marketing experts out there, but I mean the, the labeling and the advertising of bottled um, fruit smoothies or so-called protein shakes or what you might find at a um, coffee shop or a smoothie shop when you really investigate what's in it, um, not only ingredients, but how that um, combination unfolds in terms of carbs, protein, fats, there oftentimes, and I've done my research, there oftentimes um, is very little protein, um, a, a bunch of added sugar, and so that, that load of sugar and carbohydrate on the body is, is quite a hit. Um, and so even though it may look good or sound good, it's can be processed pretty darn quickly um, and, and give you quite a bit of um, excessive calories for, for what it's worth. So if you are um, following the You Can Smoothie approach, I'll, I'll show you two of uh, the ones that um, you know, are pretty, pretty popular and pretty common, that, and there, there's a whole variety of these, and, and actually uh, as a nice treat, Dean has allowed us to raffle off um, a couple uh, copies of her uh, smoothie book um, here today, so you'll, you'll get some information about that as well. But, um, you know, I think that's a great I, – I, I have the book, and it's, it's a great in terms of variety. If you are a smoothie person, really getting some variation um, to your shakes, some with you can, uh, many without as well. But from a you can perspective, uh, you know, this one you see on the screen, um, the vanilla cream you can with protein, getting some good fat from the avocado – 
um, some nice flavor and uh, maybe a little bit of additional um, calories, carbohydrate from the strawberries. And then we like to use the, uh, the unsweetened almond milks uh, so we don't get a lot of additional sugar. Um, that's a, a really, really solid uh, both post-workout or, or breakfast type of smoothie. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't show you guys probably everyone's favorite you can smoothie if I had to uh, if I had to ask around, which is the uh, the chocolate you can with protein with a third of a banana. Again, we, we use a third of a banana for flavor. We don't use the full banana to try to keep the sugar lower uh, if possible. Um, the unsweetened almond milk again, and then um, some good fat from the peanut butter. So. Um, two very uh, popular UCAN recipes, and I'll, I will send around a, a, a UCAN specific recipe book uh, in the follow-up email to everyone as well. There's uh, several smoothies. You can actually access this right off the homepage of the UCAN website, but uh, as you can see me scroll through, you see many, uh, many different varieties. Uh, Dina, what, uh, what is your, uh, over the years, been your favorite smoothie concoction with UCAN? Oh my gosh. It changes every day. Varun, I'm not even kidding. I make a smoothie five out of seven days of the week, and I make one for me and one for my husband. I, I should say that not every single one has UCAN in it, but um, my favorite recent UCAN smoothie would be um, I've used the vanilla protein-enhanced UCAN with about a third to a half of a cup of pumpkin puree. And then I love cinnamon and pumpkin spice, so I add that. And I've used um, coconut milk. And then I've added some coconut flakes or shredded coconut. Just I'm a coconut fan. Um, and then actually um, touch it off a bit with some almond butter. So, I mean, it, that thing lasts me a long time. It is so tasty if you like pumpkin. And are you, are, are you a smoothie person, Dina? You just mentioned smoothies five of seven days of the, of the week. Are you a smoothie person year-round, or is this yeah. something that you are? Okay, cool. Yeah. So, and, yeah. and does the composition of your smoothies change much uh, depending on the volume of your training, or, or is it always sort of centered around controlling your blood sugar regardless of the time of the year? The only time I change it much would be if it is pre pre-workout or pre-run especially um, you know lately I've the last few years I've done more ultra running so like if it's a three four hour kind of day or, or longer I'll use more you can um, so maybe a mix of plain and some protein enhanced and not use too much fat um, just because I'll have it right before I go out and I don't want to feel too full so it's just backing off a bit on the fat and adding more of the super starch Interesting. So that's that's a good, uh, you know, kind of personal example for how you will adjust, you know, even if it might be subtly, you will, uh, you know, consider the activity or, or the, the training period that you're in and sort of adjust the, the composition of that smoothie. Uh, one more for you, Dina, just um, coming from the audience. In general, when you're putting, yeah, people seem to be fascinated on uh, what you have to say, you know, getting, I guess, getting an inside look at a dietitian's brain as she uh, puts together her... Uh, her smoothies, but um, <laughs> when, when you're thinking about what goes in there, how are you choosing your ingredients? You know, or like, yeah, how, how do you how do you come up with all these different varieties? But is there anything consistent um, across these various recipes that you try to adhere to? That's a good question. Yeah, well, I mean, thinking of blood sugar control, if this is a meal we're talking about or a snack, protein, fat, fiber, right? That's something you and I have said a lot and it's been said before um, by many of our colleagues. So where's the protein? So if that's protein enhanced you can or you add a touch of your own protein powder on top of what's in the protein enhanced you can. Where's the fat? So um, almond milk provides you a little or maybe it's a different kind of milk, um, fuller fat milk from coconut you know, pure coconut milk, or if you're using um, cow milk, you know, and it's fuller fat or full fat yogurt, nuts, seeds, nut butter, avocado, oils, etc. And then fiber, um, I think about, so that can come maybe from some of the fat source. So avocados have a little bit of fiber. There's a little bit of fiber in nuts or nut butter. Um, fruits will provide a little bit of fiber. So that's a good protein, fat, fiber mantra, I guess, for assembling 
um, a meal, liquid meal. <laughs> um, if it's, you know, and depending on your flavor preferences, you may add fruit, like this slide showing some banana or some strawberries or, or dates can be another one. Um, so you get maybe a touch more fiber, a touch more carbohydrate, um, but it just rounds out the flavor to your preferences a bit more. Awesome, and I think it's um, you know a good uh, for maybe for some folks uh, maybe uh, the fact that you started with the protein and the fat, and then you know sort of uh, mentioned the fruit more towards the end. Whereas you know when we talked about the Jamba Juice example, it's like fruit, 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 and then let's see if we can sneak anything else in there. I think that that right there, just the way you described it, gives all of us a little bit of insight into the uh, into the mind of a dietitian, which is uh, which is helpful, very helpful. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, that's great, Dina. I think um, you know we, we've we've covered a lot today, um, and definitely your personal uh, experiences, excuse me, are, are much appreciated. Is there anything um, as we sum this up? Just one or two takeaways in terms of nutrition for the off season. That that if people can leave this and remember one or two things, um, what would you want them to take away? Gosh, I mean, it's definitely time to enjoy the the season that it, you know, everything that it brings to you personally. Um, but I, I think also taking advantage of some downtime to really think about your own personal health, um, your health status, your health goals, and then if you're, um, you know, active or athletic individual, what is limiting you to be even better? Um, and, and then act on those things. Um, you know, maybe you just develop your plan in the off season, and then get it going um, January, whenever is fine. But just, just you know, do that self assessment and then um, act on it. Life's too short to to let it go too stagnant. So um, you know, take take yourself up to that next level of health and and performance. Well, that's great, and and you know, I would just uh, piggyback uh, from a UCAN perspective. Just uh, hopefully that, that you know we can understand why Dina is on here today, as she talks about blood sugar control. Um, you know why she also is on here talking about UCAN because they they fit you know very well hand in hand together. So for for those of you that are familiar with UCAN and have used it in your training, or or you know have have heard about it and aren't quite sure what it is, just know that that this is something that can be very applicable when you're in the heart of your training, but is also something that fits a lot of the principles of what we're looking to do in the off season in order to maintain, uh, you know, our level of fitness and, and to take care of our health, which is control blood sugar. So that's what you can really comes back to is it's, it's yet another tool in your belt to control blood sugar and, and, you know, a great addition to your, your smoothies and shakes. And, and there's certainly other creative ways to incorporate it into your diet. Um, I just want to say a big thanks to everybody for, for spending uh, an hour with us here this afternoon, especially a huge thanks to Dina. Um, if, if you are interested in getting in touch with Dina or, or checking out more of what she has to say on her blog, uh, all of her info will be included in the, the email you're going to be getting after the webinar. You'll also get a full recording to the session and uh, in that email uh, there will be uh, a way to enter to win a raffle for Dina's smoothie book. So basically uh, I'll be sending all of you guys a special offer on UCAN and if you take advantage of that here in the next week you will automatically be entered to win a copy of Dina's smoothie book. And I just want to add one more thing. Um, as we are uh, here talking about the off season, uh, we do have a, a great offer that you'll also get from our partners uh, with TriDot uh, Training Systems. They're a, a triathlon uh, training platform and software that that um, you know, and, and they've launched something called the Preseason Project, which is their term for the off season. But it's uh, it's a great uh, free opportunity for for you guys to really uh, get a better understanding of your training and and you know go through some of their methodology and. Um, see how it can impact you uh, as you're in the off season. So make sure to also check that out. That is a special offer that's being extended to all of you that were able to join us here today. Um, with that, Dina, thanks so much for your time. I always love doing this with you. And uh, I know that as training starts up again, before we know it, we will probably be back on here in the upcoming months talking about another uh, fascinating nutrition topic. So until next time, uh, can't wait to do that. Thank you, Varun. Always a good time.
Awesome. Um, and Dina, last thing for you. How can people, if they just want to uh, at least uh, follow you on social media and see some of uh, what you post there, what's the best way for people to connect with you on social media? Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Twitter is Dina Griffin RD, I think. <laughs> I, I just pulled it up. It. That's correct. Yep. It's uh, Dina Griffin, oh two Fs, RD, just like yeah. uh, registered dietitian. Yep. I have no right. idea what my Instagram account is, but... Um, Facebook, yeah, I'm on Facebook as well. Or you can email me, and I can give you all that info. So it's um, Dina D I N A at Energy Performance E N R G Performance dot com. And I'm going to, uh, like I said, I'm going to include that in the follow up email. But for anybody that's interested, um, I just did post that in the chat as well. So Energy okay. Performance is where Dina works, and Dina at Energy Performance dot com is how you can reach her. Uh, thanks so much, Dina. I'm Varn Schreer. I really appreciate everybody else joining us today, and thanks again, Dina. Thank you. Have a good night.